College Writing Oral Report Annotated Bibliography by Michael Chiango October 7, 2020 The Abrahamic Religions and Gender Conformity Introduction The definition of feminism is as follows. Quote, the doctrine of advocating social, political, and other rights of women equal to those of men. The assumption made by a person subscribing to feminist thought is that women do not have the same rights awarded to men, and when looked at through the lens of history, anyone who cares about egalitarianism will find it difficult to co not to come away with some sort of feminist perspective. While the roles of women have varied from culture to culture over millennia, for the most part, women have been treated largely as second-class citizens by patriarchal rulers. Feminism as a concept emerged in the Western world in the late 18th century with upper-class white women who used their relative privilege in society to push for changes that mostly benefited them. Over time, however, the feminist movement expanded to fight for issues that affected all women. The fight for women's equality, socially and legally, has been a slow and grueling one that has been going on for over two centuries. Women did not even have the right to vote in the United States until the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, and supporters of the suffrage movement beforehand faced fierce resistance, including jailing and physical abuse. In most developed societies, and many underdeveloped societies in the modern world, women have far more power and opportunities awarded to them than ever before, and the larger international community sees the emancipation and education of women worldwide as one of the most important goals to work towards for the prosperity of humankind. The feminist movement is not truly over, as there are still many countries where women are not giving equal rights to men, and even in countries where they are, there are still many lasting sexist attitudes and ideas that work to marginalize women and keep them subservient. One criticism that some make of modern feminist movements is that they do not do enough to criticize and fight against religiously based sexism. Particularly, the Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, which, unlike many other religions of the past, which have claimed that a female deity was responsible for birth and creation into existence, instead endorse the idea of a patriarchal father figure that created the world and issues edicts that his people must follow. There's a long history of people using the Abrahamic religions to justify sexism and the subjugation of women in society, and with slightly over half the world's population adhering to some kind of Abrahamic faith, it is worthwhile to dive deeply into the relationship between Abrahamic monotheism and views about gender roles and feminism, and how to best deal with pro problematic ideas. As the following annotated articles will show, forms of adherence and interpretations of sacred texts can often lead to traditionalist ideas about gender roles in society, but that is not always the case, and those who do not hold to any particular religion do not always devote themselves to the case of gender equality either. Article 1 by Victoria Harrison Modern Women, Traditional Abrahamic Religions, and Interpreting Sacred Texts From Feminist Theology, The Journal of Britain and Ireland School of Feminist Theology, Volume 15 Summary this scholarly article is taken from the Journal of the Britain and Ireland School of Feminist Theology from pages 145 to 159. The article is a look into the perspective of so-called religious feminists, particularly of the Abrahamic religions, who recognize the ways in which Abrahamic religions and their interpretations by men over the centuries have led to systemic discrimination and disempowerment of women, as well as their exclusion from the very traditions that the patriarchy uses to marginalize them. However, religious feminists do not reject their heritage or their faith, and instead seek new ways to, in which to interpret the scriptures of their traditions from a feminist perspective, or add their own narrative to their religions. The article first looks at examples of Christian feminists attempting to rectify their religious values with their feminist values, and then does the same with Jewish feminists and Muslim feminists, and concludes by reasoning that as women become more active in their traditions of faith, they will likely have a great effect on the changing ways in which the scriptures are interpreted, allowing both genders to see them in a different light. Analysis 
The confrontation between the ideas of modern women and the beliefs and practices of traditional Judaism, Christianity, and Islam has not, for the most part, been experienced as a challenge coming from outside each tradition. Rather, the challenge has come from within, as Jewish, Christian, and Muslim women have become increasingly conscious of what they perceive as sexism within their respective traditions. Harrison, Victoria, page 145. These are the first two sentences of the article, and they set up the major narrative that it focuses on. Women trying to work within traditional religious structures in order to change them, rather than simply rejecting them wholesale. The article never tries to deny the fact that many discriminatory laws and customs can find their origins in the Abrahamic religion's dogmatism, and fully admits that that is a major problem, yet it does not discuss the implications of the fact that scriptures inspired by the supposedly omnibenevolent God have such a history of being used to justify sexism and misogyny against women. Instead, the article is dedicated to discussing influential religious feminists of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and the ways in which they have gone about trying to reform their respective religious cultures. Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who lived from 1826 to 1898, was a gender equality activist who discovered a dis- systemic link between Christianity and the social, economic, and cultural oppression of women. But rather than opposing Christianity itself, she remained a committed Presbyterian who argued that Christian religious beliefs had evolved over the centuries into something different than they used to be, and that the evolution of Christianity had been manipulated by men to serve their interests and oppose those of women. Matilda pointed out that when the religion of Christianity was first founded, there were many female followers of Christ who served the Lord, occupying prominent roles in early Christian communities, and it was only several centuries after Christ's death that women were completely excluded from leadership roles in the church in favor of an exclusively male clergy. She preached that Christianity should be purged of its male distortions, and that people needed to follow what she called, quote, true religion. She placed heavy blame onto the New Testament figure Paul, who has several sexist writings to his name and interpreted the story of Adam and Eve in a particular way as to illustrate the inferiority of women to men, an interpretation that still stands in many religious communities. She also places much of the blame for Christian oppression and subjugation of women on the idea that God is a specifically male father figure and that only men and not women were created in God's image, implying that women were lesser beings. Judith Plaskow, born in 1947, was a Jewish feminist who was particularly concerned with how the old Jewish scriptures and laws seemed to exclude women from the Jewish covenant with God, which is what is supposed to define the identity of a Jew. Plaskow concluded that to accept the idea that Jewish women are not part of God's covenant is unacceptable, and Jewish women know that they are God's people every bit as much as men are. So it is the responsibility of Jewish feminists to, quote-unquote, reform the Torah, While Plaskow recognized the fact that the Torah is regarded by many to be directly inspired by God and thus not open to reinterpretation, she advises that people utilize careful study and prayer to determine the true divine fullness of the quote-unquote primordial Torah, which will reveal a unique perspective on the issue of women in God's covenant. Amina Wahud Musin, born in 1952, is a Muslim feminist who has strived to push back against the neoconservative male-centric interpretations of the Quran that she believes are inaccurate because for over a millennium they were interpreted exclusively by males who crafted their own narrative based on their own experiences. She seeks to provide a new interpretation of the Islamic texts that will be more meaningful to women that has not been present previously because a masculine viewpoint has been used for so long to view the text through that lens. According to her, the Quran actually has the potential to serve as a text of great liberation for women who have been oppressed by the Muslim patriarchy, but who still wish to hold on to their faith. In her view, Islam is a universal religion precisely because it can have different interpretations to fit changing times and cultures, rather than being a single unchanging doctrine. Throughout the entire scholarly article and the recounting of the exploits of these women, there is never once a single justification given for why it is necessary to continue to cling to religion in the first place. Instead, it is simply taken as a given that these women should continue to remain a part of the religious cultures that were responsible for the horrible repression of women for over a millennium. This article does not explicitly argue in favor of this religious feminist perspective and merely 
relays it to the we- reader, but seeing as how it does not make any effort to push back against this unjustified assumption of the preservation of religious traditions, it is hard not to see a passive endorsement of it. The concept of religious reform is made problematic by the idea that religious texts and traditions are meant to be the objective will of the all-powerful God. While the religious feminists in the article claim that the scriptures and traditions and their interpretations have been manipulated by men to suit a patriarchal agenda, their critiques could just as easily be turned upon them by saying that they are trying to manipulate these scriptures and traditions and their interpretations to suit a feminist agenda. Who are Christian feminists to claim that women deserve equality when Paul, the most prominent figure in the New Testament outside of Jesus, said that he would not allow women to teach or have authority over men, as in 1 Timothy 2.12? Who are Jewish feminists to claim that women deserve equality when the instructions in God's perfect covenant given for public religious worship specifically included men and excluded women? Who are Muslim feminists to claim that women deserve equality when the Quran specifically states that one male witness is equal to two female witnesses, as in Al-Baqarah 2.282, and a male gets twice the inheritance of a female, as in An-Nisa 4.11? Even the scholarly article points out that the original texts of these religions provide very difficult obstacles for religious feminists trying to override the religious fundamentalists and literalists who claim that sacred texts cannot be amended. Ibn Waraq, founder of the Institute for the Secularization of Islam Society, is quoted in the article as saying, To do battle with the Orthodox, the fanatics, and the mullahs in the interpretation of these texts is to do battle on their terms, on their ground. For every text that you produce, they will produce a dozen others contradicting yours. The reformists cannot win on these terms. End quote. In the end, it seems as though, regardless of the practicality of working within the terms of religious adherence to attempt to advance the cause of gender equality rather than actively opposing the religion itself, the religious feminists in the scholarly article can only offer a particular feminist interpretation of their scriptures and traditions that must compete with a patriarchal one, and the success of their efforts will not be based on the validity of their arguments, but rather on how attractive their new doctrine will be to those exposed to it. It does beg the question, however, that if God truly does value gender equality, if they do exist, that is, then why would they not be able to make that abundantly clear without a doubt to every person on earth rather than leaving their worshippers to argue about ancient texts, mistranslations, and misinterpretations and what things are meant to be taken literally or are metaphorical and only appropriate for a certain time period? Article 2 by Andrew Whitehead and Perry Samuel Is a Christian America a more patriarchal America? Religion, Politics, and Traditionalist Gender Ideology by the Canadian Review of Sociology, Volume 56, Number 2. Summary This scholarly article is an academic research paper that looks at Christian nationalism in the United States and how it influences the politics of its adherents. In particular, the article determines whether Christian nationalism tends to lead to more traditional and patriarchal values about the family unit. An analysis produced from a survey of 1,501 American adults randomly selected across the country by mail address shows that Christian nationalism is the highest indicator that someone will hold to a traditionalist patriarchal gender ideology. Analysis Quote, such findings suggest a fundamental connection between Christian nationalism and rigid symbolic boundaries, which would likely extend to Americans' understanding of gender roles. Unquote. This quote given in the abstract of the article is an interesting observation. A Christian nationalist is a person who believes that Christianity should be intertwined with government and that the foundation of the United States should be based upon Christian principles in violation of the Free Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. Although the percentage of non-religious people, or nuns, in the United States has risen rapidly over the past few decades, the United States still has an overwhelming majority of self-described Christian adherents, 65% in 2019, yet not all of these people would be Christian nationalists. Many Christians in the United States see their religious beliefs as a matter between them and God, and not something to be imposed upon other people, which in the article is described as, quote, civil religion. 
On the other hand, what the quote above pulled from the abstract suggests is that Christian nationalists have a rigid definition of what is proper and improper, and wish to enforce what they believe to be God's will by fighting over largely symbolic issues like gay marriage and other atypical family configurations that are an affront to good old Christian values. The article goes on to make the connection between Christian nationalism and the 2016 presidential election, where white evangelicals came out in droves to support Donald Trump. Despite Trump being divorced twice, having multiple sexual assault cases brought against him, and being just generally a rich, greedy, self-obsessed businessman, in stark contrast to Jesus Christ, who preached against the very concept of wealth, it is true that Trump constantly pandered to the Christian nationalist base of the Republican Party with his rhetoric about how America needed to return back to its Christian roots, and he still attempts to pander to Christian nationalists to this day, like when he had military personnel use tear gas on peaceful protesters on his way to do a Bible photo op. Not only is whether or not someone is a Christian nationalist the best indicator of whether that person possesses traditionalist views about gender and the family, but it was also the biggest indicator on whether that person voted for Trump in the 2016 election. The article also states how Christian nationalism has been studied to be linked to the desire to restrict immigration, prejudiced attitudes towards Muslims, prejudice against black Americans, opposition to gun control, a desire for more foreign interventions, and a sense of cultural superiority. In other words, these so-called defenders of Christianity tend not to focus on the parts of the Bible where Jesus says to love your neighbor as yourself, and instead hyper-focus on the parts of the Bible that profess authoritarian measures of social control, and those that talk about the cultural cleansing and keeping the wicked separate from the pure. The article goes on to make the connection between Christian nationalism and the phenomenon of sacralizing ideology. It becomes difficult to distinguish between a Christian claiming that his religion is superior to all others, worshipping the male deity God and the patriarchal figures of the Bible, and claiming that the Bible is the absolute truth beyond revision or interpretation, and a neoconservative claiming that the American way of life is superior to all other countries, deifying the patriarchal founding fathers of America's past, and claiming that the Constitution is the untouchable law of the land beyond revision or interpretation. There is almost always an overlap. What the article fails to mention is that many Christian nationalists today advocate a return to biblical marriage, but they are not actually advocating for real biblical marriage, as polygamy is the most common form of marriage seen in the Bible, and it is never once explicitly condemned. Even so, regardless of the specifics of what the Bible actually portrays and advocates for, its consistent authoritarian and patriarchal subtext and sometimes outright statement of humanity being subject to the will of a patriarchal father figure who has a narrow and rigid definition of the roles for people in society can easily feed into not just Christian nationalism but also a traditionalist view of gender and gender roles. This scholarly article is different from the previous ones in that it does not exclusively talk about women's issues but also extends to discuss broader forms of bigotry tied to religion as well as political issues, and does not focus on efforts by individuals to try to combat a problem within society. However, it is also an article based on survey data, and that survey data focuses exclusively on different demographics' propensity towards traditional values about gender and gender roles. These survey answers can be thought of as generally reliable as they received a 13.6% response rate and the fact that the surveys were physically mailed out to randomly selected addresses across the country means that these statistics gleaned from the survey are not slanted by inaccessibility to or low use of internet as among some different demographics. The survey was pen and paper and asked a series of four questions to determine how much the participants valued gender traditionalism and six questions to determine how much a Christian nationalist they were, as well as asking further questions to determine the demographics of those answering the survey. Without going into highly technical specifics about how the results were determined and graphed, the survey concluded, as was expected, that the Christian nationalism was the highest indicator of gender traditionalist values. Catholics, Jews, and mainline Protestants were slightly less likely than average to hold traditionalist gender values, while black Protestants were slightly more likely than average to hold traditionalist gender values, and evangelical Protestants and biblical literalists were right behind those identifying as politically conservative in how likely they were to support gender tra traditionalist values. The survey also produced some interesting results in regards to the other demographics asked about, finding that education and income level correlated negatively with gender traditionalist values 
and that describing oneself as politically liberal was the most likely indicator for not holding to tra gender traditionalist values, followed by believing that the Bible was a mere book of legends and not having any religious faith. Christian tradition not only has the tendency to feed into authoritarian patriarchal inclinations of nationalists, but also gives nationalists an effective tool and excuse for spreading their ideology. This article is important because it shows that the kind of Christian an American is, in the degree to which one holds to traditionalist values on gender and gender roles, matters much more than their denomination or whether they or not they are a Christian. Of course, like all surveys and polling, there are blind spots in how much it can truly reveal, particularly since correlation does not equal causation. The article admit, admits as much that the survey cannot determine whether or not propensity for Christian nationalism or other, any other demographic fact causes a person to hold more gender traditionalist values, or if it is unrelated or the other way around. It is certainly easy to see how those Christians who believe that the government should uphold and enforce their particular religion would naturally be inclined to want to enforce a traditional gender view and believe that women have certain roles in society that are different than men's, but it could very much be the case that the phenomenon is the opposite for some. Those who do not believe in egalitarianism and believe that women should occupy a certain place in society subservient to that of men could flock to religious fundamentalism and nationalism to try to advance their own agenda by deferring to God and the Bible. In reality, both are probably true, with Christian nationalism and gender conservatism feeding into one another and strengthening themselves, which have led to the rapid rise in religious fundamentalism in the past decades alongside rapid developments in societal values towards religion and gender roles. Annotation 3. Jonathan Simmons. Atheism plus what? Sh social justice and lifestyle politics among Edmonton atheists. From the Canadian Journal of Sociology. Volume 42, number 4. Summary. This scholarly article is an analysis of the political and ideological persuasions of atheists residing in the U.S. and Canada. In particular, it looks at the two major competing ideological and political stances that seem to have created a massive rift between atheist activists. Rationalist Enlightenment Libertarianism versus Humanist Social Justice Leftism. The data for the article was not gathered by scientific statistics, but instead case studies, where the researcher interviewed 19 men and 16 women from three atheist organizations in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Sources and writings, many originating from the blogosphere, were gathered representing both sides of the ideological divide among the atheist community, and the article lays out a framework for understanding secular activists' complicated relationship to social justice, particularly on the topic of feminism. Analysis The previous two articles laid out clear correlations between Abrahamic religious belief, particularly religious nationalism, and sexist and misogynistic beliefs about traditional gender roles. The solution presented by religious feminists in the first article is built upon unjustified assumptions and has not been shown to produce an effective response against the fundamentalist and religious nationalists. The data from the second article showcased that those with no religion and those who believe that the Bible is a mere book of legends have the lowest correlation with beliefs in traditional gender roles out of any of the categories given except for those who identify as politically liberal, which atheists have also been found to overwhelmingly identify as. The data seem to very much go against the negative conception of atheists that they are simply immoral degenerates with no regard for social justice. It is quite difficult to find an atheist in America who identifies as conservative or republican, or who stands for traditionalist gender roles, although there are some that exist. However, it appears that the abandonment of the Abrahamic faiths overwhelmingly favor a conversion to a progressive outlook on politics and gender issues. Yet perhaps the surface-level data on atheists and non-believers conceals a more complex situation regarding atheists' views on social justice. Atheists themselves are still a stigmatized group in the United States, largely as a result of the efforts of the Christian nationalists talked about in the previous article, but atheists in the United States are still overwhelmingly white, male, and highly educated, and many publicly atheist figures were at odds with these social justice movements, what they called the regressive left, and refer to themselves as anti-feminists. This article attempts to present a greater understanding of what values non-religious people hold about topics like politics, feminism, and social justice. 
Unlike the previous article, which included a survey of over 1,000 people for its data to analyze, this article instead relied on a small non-random case study of only 36 people conducted by the author in a particular location. So it is doubtful that the insight gained from it is able to be applied to a much larger scale. And there's also the problem of the case study only having interviewed secular activists, people who organize against religion and superstition and for science and skepticism, which is not representative of all people who identify as non-religious or even representative of all atheists. Still, case studies do have their merits in gaining more holistic information from people and determining causes and effects of societal phenomena than surveys and censuses can. The author first addresses in the article the emergence and relative lack of success of a movement started by atheist activists called Atheism Plus. Atheism Plus held to the idea that if religious holy books contained within them ideas and traditions that were harmful to society, then it should be the duty of secular activists to stand up for social justice and achieve equity, and stand against all forms of bigotry and inequality. This movement was attacked and ridiculed by many atheist activists, causing massive infighting among the larger atheist movement over politics both online and offline. Atheist activists, who were also advocates for social justice, claimed that the atheist community had become insular, elitist, and white male-centric, and was not flexing its influence to try to solve major societal issues. There is somewhat of an argument to be made for organization and solidarity among atheist activists, not only to try to pull in new members for a currently very niche subculture in the Western world, but also to generate positive publicity and associate atheism and non-religious people with justice and civil rights activism. What the author of the article found when he was interviewing the 35 participants in the case study was that most identified as liberal and left-leaning, and none identified as conservatives. However, only six identified as feminists, and many were critical of movements like feminism, social justice, and atheism plus. The author explains this apparent contradiction by remarking on how, despite only four of the participants in the case study identifying as politically libertarian, many still held to a libertarian enlightenment philosophy and thought that atheist activism was a lifestyle movement dedicated to helping free individuals from the shackles of superstition and religious dogma and realize their true potential in life, rather than a social movement dedicated to addressing widespread in injustice in society. Highly personalized politics was a major theme the author witnessed when interviewing his participants in Edmonton, which greatly disincentivized collective unity towards any cause, and many of the participants he interviewed, including women, remarked on their displeasure that people were trying to make atheist activism stand for a political movement like feminism rather than rationality, science, and criticism of superstition. While humanistic left-wing atheists dedicated to social justice often attack libertarian enlightenment atheists, for being blind to the serious issues that women and minorities face, libertarian enlightenment atheists often criticize humanistic left-wing atheists for being too soft on marginalized religions like Islam and abandoning scientific rationality and logic in favor of unfettered dedication to a social cause that should not be questioned, similar to how religion often asks. It must be emphasized that this article is somewhat one-sided, as it does not focus as much on those atheist activists who consider themselves to be part of Atheism Plus, and their justifications for what they focus on in their activism. Quotes from people given in the article obtained from participants in the case study, such as, First of all, name one right that men have that women don't have, by Max, age 22, could be countered by social justice humanists by saying that, even though women officially occupy the same status as men in society, there is still discrimination towards them and unique challenges they face based on their gender due to regressive values and biases that many men still hold. Because many libertarian enlightenment atheists value personal freedom and accomplishment and the rejection of dogmatic ideologies and social organizations, it is not likely that those kinds of people would hold anything against egalitarianism and the freedom for women to take whatever path they desire in life, as opposed to the Christian nationalist intent on maintaining gender traditionalism, and indeed, in the case study conducted by the author, there was no hint that any of the participants were against non-traditional gender roles, and many were part of an organization where the majority of executives were women. Thus, this infighting within the atheist community t throughout the English-speaking countries does not appear to be a battle between people who believe in egalitarianism and people who believe in traditional gender hierarchy. It is instead a battle between atheists who have different priorities and focuses and desires for what they want secular activism to be about. 
The simple reality is that although non-religious people tend to be more progressive than the rest of the population, at least in the US and Canada, atheists are not one hegemonic group united around a single cause or ideology, and there are significant differences and diversity of thought between individuals which is celebrated by some and dismayed by others. Rather than having a genuine discussion and conversation about differences, though, online discourse in the atheist community nowadays has people constantly talking over each other's heads, ready to write off other people as worthless degenerates for disagreeing with them 30% of the time. Both sides end up claiming that the other is being unscientific and reactionary in its rhetoric, and members on both sides begin to move towards farther extremes because no understanding can be gained. This quote given in the article is a good summary of the current state of political discourse among secularists, and quite honestly, a uh, new atheist could easily just be swapped for a social justice movement, and the quote would still ring every bit as true. Quote, The prime target of the social justice movement is people who are almost exactly like themselves. Social justice people weren't targeting the Westboro Baptists, they weren't targeting Boko Haram or any of their natural enemies, they weren't really targeting Republicans that much. They were mostly targeting enlightened liberals who just had a slightly different opinion than them." Unquote. While retrospection is important to consider if those who have left their religious beliefs behind have truly distanced themselves from the patriarchal traditionalist ideas about gender that are tied with those beliefs, even if they outwardly claim that they have, it is also important to realize that those atheist activists who are not feminists and even may, might describe themselves as anti-feminists might still be completely against all forms of sexism and traditional gender roles and actually have legitimate grievances and criticisms that deserve to be heard out. Conclusion There can be no denying the monumental impact that the Abrahamic religions have had on the world. Traditions in violent conflict with one another for centuries, and yet all tracing back to the ancient writings about the patriarchal father Abraham and the patriarchal god he worshipped. Because they have had such a large impact on the world, it is incredibly important to study this impact and what results it has yielded. Although we might not always realize it in our day-to-day -day lives, our values and the assumptions we make about the world and about certain groups of people are heavily influenced by our current culture at large. And our current culture at large was heavily influenced by the culture and traditions of the past. Denying the Abrahamic religion's active involvement in the perpetuation of oppressive gender norms and stereotypes is dishonesty in the highest degree, and we should strive towards not only reform, but also seriously addressing what it says about the religions that are meant to be the inspired words of God that they have been responsible for this millennium-plus-old paradigm, as well as considering where to go if we do decide to depart from the religious traditions so influential to our society.